Joshua Epps. Okay, so now what I say uh, is being kept for posterity. So I guess when I say that Joshua was one of my uh, inspirations for agent-based modeling and social simulation, that's now a, a matter of official record. Um, uh, he, he's worked, uh, I think, mainly on um, uh, sort of health-related issues, given his affiliation. But uh, uh, there's no doubt that I think Joshua is uh, one of the um, you know, real um, uh, inspirations for many of us in, in agent-based modeling, much more generally. And uh, he's, he's been very influential with a number of books besides uh, Growing Artificial Societies. And uh, this latest work on inverse generative social science, is, I think, is, is particularly interesting. And it's starting to bring in work from artificial intelligence uh, as well, which I think is another community that would be very good for us to reach out to. So I think, I, I think it, it shows again that he's, he's still ahead of the curve and uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear what he say. Um, Flaminio asked if I would plug the uh, inverse generative social science session, which is um, uh, going to be uh, taking place at the, um, in the conference. It's in the schedule to so just, just, uh, just have a look through the set schedule and uh, I should just say for the people organizing other sessions that other parallel sessions are also available, uh, no doubt, just as interesting. But uh, this is a really good one. And um, there will, I think, be a special issue of JAS on inverse generative social science uh, with a number of uh, papers. Uh, so that is another thing uh, worth looking out for. Uh, I think uh, then, without further ado, it's uh, over to you, uh, Joshua, um, please uh, go ahead with your talk. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I think you, you and, and your and you're very dangerous admission uh, at how much I've influenced you. Um, so I'm very, very honored to be here. And uh, yeah, I wanna talk about inverse generative social science and the subtitle is From Intelligent Agent Design to the Blind Model Maker. Um, and if this will advance, that would be great. My main affiliations, just to see them, is that I'm professor of epidemiology at NYU, director of our agent-based modeling lab, affiliated uh, faculty at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Department of Politics, and of course, the Santa Fe Institute. So I'd be de I'm delighted to be here to discuss this idea, I don't know why that's not advancing on its own, of inverse generative social science. And I will say, this is the title of two international workshops we held in 2020 and 2021, and of the IGSS panel uh, that Gary mentioned here at CSS. I think that's on Thursday. Um, it's also the main title of my lead off article in, yes, a special guest edited section of JAS on this topic. And along with me, the guest editors are Erez Hatna, Matt Kohler, Yvonne Garabay and Bill Rand, who were also core organizers, co-organizers of these workshops. So thanks to them. And very special thanks, of course, to Gary and, uh, and to Flaminio Squazzoni for his visionary support of this work and his patience uh, throughout. Um, let's start with the name here. I, I call this approach inverse generative social science because I'm interested in explaining social phenomena, not physics. I have a specific generative notion of explanation in mind. And inverse computational methods, notably evolutionary computing, can produce agents, in fact, families of agents, meeting that explanatory standard. Uh, this has been on my mind for, for a little while. Uh, in 1992, I, I wrote a memo to the then president of the Santa Fe Institute, Ed Knapp, on using GAs to grow artificial societies. And at the time I was interested, as I remain interested in the question, is there a small set of local rules, that is rules governing the behavior of individual agents that over many iterations will generate a crude caricature of say, the observed international system. And some of the questions on my mind that remain on my mind are what systems of local rules will generate politically egalitarian societies, totalitarian ones, violent ones, competitive ones, and so forth. And the thought was, let's turn a GA loose on this. And here are the steps that I had in mind at the time. I think they're a little bit 
uh, dated, and the steps I will review shortly are a little more up to date. But you know, this has been something brewing in my own mind for quite a while, uh, and I I will add this as an appendix to my to my article for 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 anyone's interest. Um, so things have advanced dramatically since then, and there are related lines of work uh, that I think deserve mention. One is evolutionary model discovery by, uh, that's, this is undertaken by Chataka Gunaratne and Ivan Garibay. I'll talk about that. Rule induction, uh, Bill Rand, computational abduction, uh, Marat, I mean, Madhav Maratha and others at the uh, University of Virginia, inductive game theory that Simon Dedeo and David Krakauer have been, have been doing. These are all getting at related things, although they have different goals. Uh, but I think with inverse generative social science, we're, we're exploring a transition, okay? From intelligent design of agent models to the evolution of agents. So, the, on the intelligent design problem, I see the agent-based model as the main scientific instrument of generative social science. Today, agent modeling has been largely the direct intelligent design of completed software agents, fully endowed with rules intended to collectively generate or grow social phenomena from the bottom up. And obviously our field has exploded over the last decades with major impact on many fields, including epidemiology, violence, archeology, span economics, segregation, urban dynamics, all sorts of things at scales ranging from the literally cellular to the literally planetary. And this practice of intelligent design will, and I think should continue. But we're interested in standing this paradigm, if you like, on its head. Rather than handcrafting completed agents to grow a target, which I think of as the forward problem, we start with the macro target and evolve generative micro agents from primitive agent constituents and combinators. So rather than agents as designed inputs, we're interested in agents, we indeed families of agents as evolved outputs. This is the backward problem or the inverse problem. And tools from AI, evolutionary computing, genetic programming especially, can help us solve it. And I think this would be a new use of AI as I'll, I'll come back to that. My subtitle, The Blind Model Maker, is of course a play on Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker, where he argues for the sufficiency of blind evolution to account for the meticulous complexity of biological phenomena like the human eye uh, or what Darwin himself called the ever increasing circles of complexity in nature, a far from equilibrium idea, if ever there was one. And we'll come back to that. So it's important, however, to notice, to, to, to say that IGSS does not change the generative explanatory standard that I'll talk to uh, more fully below, but it evolves agents satisfying that standard. And in fact, we're going to define fitness, the selection pressure on agent architectures in terms of generative sufficiency itself. As in many inverse problems, the solutions are not unique. And so IGSS typically produces multiple agent architectures that are comparably fit. I consider that an embarrassment of riches, not an embarrassment. And we'll come back to the problem of how to handle this when there are multiple generators. But all of this raises a lot of foundational questions. I think in framing those clearly, a quick review of some central goals and distinctions may be useful. Then I'll go through the concrete steps of how do you do inverse generative social science with illustrations from this forthcoming JAS collection, and then offer some concluding thoughts. So that's the plan. All right. This approach, generative social science and inverse generative social science are interested in explanations. And I have argued many times that it's important for the social sciences to adopt a specific generative explanatory standard. But before talking about that, let's just back up and distinguish between explaining why something happens and predicting that it will happen or when it will happen, just very quickly. 
to distinguish between explaining and predicting. And we're interested in explaining. So why are there earthquakes and tsunamis? Plate tectonics explains, it identifies a mechanism, but it doesn't let us predict. Why are there new viruses? Evolution explains, but we can't predict the next flu strain or the next SARS COVID-2 uh, you know, variant. So point one, explaining doesn't imply predicting. And predicting doesn't imply explaining. So here's a simple example that I like. Here's a famous time series of the Canadian Lynx data from the Hudson Bay Company. Of course, cardinal sin, I seem to have chopped out the time axis, but this covers the period 1845 to 1935. And of course, the Hudson Bay Company dealt in, in uh, Lynx pelts. So this is their data on, on pelt uh, levels over these years. Can you predict a year from prior years? Sure. Here's a nice model that fits well. Priestley published this in 81. It's an, uh, an uh, ARMA model, uh, autoregressive moving average model. But that's just a fancy way of saying, I can predict the pelt level on Tuesday as a function of the pelt level on Monday, Sunday, and Saturday. So I can predict the next day based on the previous three days with a little bit of noise. And if I pick the best coefficients, uh, I get a very good fit. So the equation does predict. Does it explain? Does it give me a mechanism for the links cycles? Is anything missing from this picture? Sure. The prey, the hare are missing. Here's a hare praying that he doesn't get eaten by a lynx. I think, uh, I think he'd be better off hiding, but that's just me. Uh, I think Dawkins would agree. Uh, in science, there's a different article, quite you know, interestingly, with the same model and different coefficients predicting the rabbit only time series. So both of these are one, one hand clapping ARMA models that predict, but neither explains the oscillations. And of course the basic mechanism as you surely anticipate is predator prey interactions. Okay, so predict and explain are logically independent. Neither implies the other, right? You might have a model that does both, but establishing them involves different criteria. And what I want to insist on is that Neither implies the other. They're logically independent. And this enterprise, IGS, IGSS, tries to enlist AI and evolutionary computing in the explanatory enterprise and in a particular kind of explanation that I've talked about again uh, in various settings, generative explanation. Um, the essential idea that you know I've stated in several publications is that to explain a social pattern, one must show how the pattern could emerge on time scales of interest to humans in a population of cognitively plausible agents. I entertained other names for this approach, constructivist, effectively computable. Generative was inspired by Tomsky. Uh, we'll come back to the notion of cognitive plausibility, but by whatever name, this is a completely distinct idea than the Nash equilibrium picture of explanation. I mean, in one important tradition, to explain a pattern is to furnish a game in which the pattern, a choice of strategies, is shown to be the Nash equilibrium or a distinguished Nash equilibrium of the game. If placed in the pattern, no agents will unilaterally depart. But that gives no account of how cognitively plausible agents attain the pattern or get out of it if it's dominated by other strategies or how long either process might take. And of course, if the pattern isn't in equilibrium at all, then the approach really has little to say. Similarly, I'm interested in something different than Gary Becker hyper-rational uh, picture. Becker's tradition is that, uh, you know, in which behaviors are taken to be explained when they're demonstrated to be extremal trajectories of an optimal control problem, as in his famous paper with, with Murphy, a, a theory of rational addiction. But you know, to set up these complicated optimization problems and solve them requires very advanced mathematics. 
So if the claim is that humans are doing this, it is certainly untenable and has been very robustly challenged, one might even say falsified, by many anomalies documented in a wide range of experimental settings from Herbert Simon to Daniel Kahneman to Tversky, Slovic, the alias and Ellsberg paradoxes, the behavioral economists, and so on. Now, one way to uh, dodge this was devised by Milton Friedman. And uh, this is a chess pun saying Friedman's gambit declined. Friedman in his famous paper, The Methodology of Positive Economics, was to grant this point that humans aren't doing this and deny imputing any such powers to humans, saying that actors behave as if they were rational, otherwise they're selected out. So he's saying, I grant you the point. I'm not claiming that humans are optimizing or computing equilibria or doing fancy things. They're just behaving as if they were rational or they're selected out. Of course, this is immediately problematic for Becker and Murphy, since what they claim to be rational, namely addiction, increases the risk of being selected out by overdoses. So I think in that case, you know, rather than a theory of rational addiction, maybe what they really displayed was an irrational addiction to theory. But when pressed, Friedman's gambit really reduces to, as if anything, random walk, habit, blind imitation that arrives at an optimum. But then since there's no commitment to any specific cognitive process, why retain the word rational at all? In turn, not everything is a choice. I'm thinking of rational choice here, of course. Never mind that we don't choose our native tongue, religion, ethnic identity, and much else. But more pertinent for our modeling, consider fear, which drives financial panics, vaccine refusal, all sorts of other phenomena. Fear isn't chosen either. I mean, if I throw a snake in your lap, you don't choose to freeze, calmly evaluating whether it's a real or a rubber snake. You instantly freeze by autonomic, automatic, neurochemical, amygdala-based fear mechanisms that are conserved across vertebrate evolution, which can be modeled, at least crudely, and included in models, which I've tried to do. And these survival circuits, uh, which, which Joe Ledoux here at NYU has, has pioneered, these can induce racial, ethnic, religious, gender, all sorts of other biases through associative conditioning. And again, we may not even be conscious of these cognitive dynamics. Uh, and I think modeling can alert us to these dynamics and hopefully increase our awareness of them and our resistance to them. Uh, that would be my hope. But the point is, a lot of our behavior is neither rational nor chosen. Uh, it's, it's not chosen and when chosen, it's not rational. So the moniker rational choice to me seems doubly misguided or at the very least restricted to a very narrow spectrum of phenomena. So a central goal, this is a major point of this talk, a central goal of inverse generative social science is to evolve cognitively plausible formal alternatives to the rational actor. And I use the word alternatives in the plural because, you know, even if you accept my little motto, if you didn't grow it, you didn't explain it. There may be many ways to grow it. There might be many agent specifications that suffice to generate the target, whatever that might be, segregation, the ancient Anasazi, or all sorts of other phenomena. And I, in, that's really why we're here, to enlist AI approaches in the discovery or construction of multiple generators. This is a different use of AI. Uh, Artificial intelligence is obviously displacing humans, it is augmenting humans, it is defeating humans, but I don't think it's yet explaining humans, and we want to enlist it in the generative explanatory enterprise. Move this thing for a minute. Sorry. Uh, so take Alpha Zero, for example. Alpha Zero annihilates humans at chess but it doesn't tell us anything about how humans play chess. Gary Kasparov defeated IBM's chess program, Deep Blue, with a brilliant sacrifice. And when he was asked, how did he come up with that? He said, it smelled right. I think we do a lot of things by smell without the explicit calculation of costs and benefits assumed in the textbook picture of choice. 
And again, the human fear apparatus is not choice-like, nor even conscious, much less rational, but it exhibits regularities, dependable regularities that we can crudely represent mathematically in agents. And I've put a very crude picture of this, a crude model of fear, learning, and extinction in my little agent zero model, who we'll come back to. So defeating humans and explaining humans is an important distinction. Another is explaining humans and emulating them. And here I think the chief offender actually was Turing himself. Uh, and this is what the Turing test is not explanatory. So Turing, Turing considered the question, can machines think to be too unclear to warrant discussion? Noam Chomsky disagreed in a wonderful and trenchant response. But Turing thought the question is just too vague and proposed to replace it with, can we distinguish the computer's responses from those of a human in his famous imitation game? So whatever else might be learned from the imitation game, I think it's clear that a machine's emulation of human output per se does not illuminate how humans generate the output. By what mechanism do they generate the output? So why do I say that? Let's, here's my imitation game. Behind the screen is a soprano and a perfect recording of that soprano. No human can tell them apart. The recording tells me nothing about how humans vocalize. By what mechanism do humans generate sounds? They blow wind across their vocal cords, producing vibrations in the air that collide with a human eardrum. So the Turing test is irrelevant to the generative mechanism in that case. Right, the, the recording of the soprano is indistinguishable from the human, but scrutinizing the CD of the soprano doesn't tell me anything about how humans vocalize. So if I'm interested in humans, this is not very revealing. And neither is the end of theory, big data impulse that's uh, here around. Here, the, the analog would be to understand how the steam engine works. Let's start by sampling clouds of emitted steam. Let's collect big steam data. Surely I can find some model that generates the same stream, steam data, but it won't tell me how the steam engine works. It might even let me predict steam at time t plus one from steam at time t, but it doesn't teach me anything about how the steam engine works. Emulation of the output does not illuminate the generative mechanism. And I think this has been a confusion with quite a lot of AI. Uh, that a trained AI can spit out grammatical English word strings doesn't tell me anything about how humans acquire grammar in the first place. Long before they even have a lexicon to train on, how does the infant brain even filter from the cacophony into which it's born? Those auditory stimuli that are even linguistically salient. The human grammar acquisition faculty. It, it, it's a hardwired cognitive endowment that the AI talking phone neither possesses nor illuminates. So these are big confusions that I think we need to combat. And I think Markov models also predict but don't explain. They're mechanism free as well. So suppose we claim to have a cognitively plausible micro mechanism, little m, that generates a target macro distribution, big M. We're sometimes told that, well, it's already been done. It's already been proved that for any M, big M, there's a Markov transition matrix T or an epsilon machine whose equilibrium limit distribution is also big M. But how does that illuminate the mechanism little m? Why are the poor to rich transition probabilities, the entries of T, so low in America? T just encodes the social problem. It doesn't explain why the transition probabilities are so low. It predicts accurately that not many poor people are going to have children who end up rich. But it doesn't explain the class structure of America. It encodes the class structure of America, and we want to explain it. OK, so I've discussed a little bit about what this is and what it isn't. So next topic, how do you actually do it? with some concrete examples from this forthcoming JAS issue. Concrete steps, and these are quite characteristic of genetic programming generally. You have to have some target. What's the target? What, what is it you're trying to grow in the first place? You have to stipulate the agent components, the ingredients, the rule constituents or primitives 
that you're going to allow to recombine and mutate and have offspring and 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 be and and be selected. All right, this is different than numerical parameters. It's rule constituents. So you have to stimulate those, and you have to stimulate how they can be combined. What are the permissible concatenations of these primitives? You need to stipulate a fitness metric so that there can be selection pressure. For replication purposes, you have to tell us exactly what evolutionary algorithm you used and stipulate a stopping rule for the algorithm because in most genetic programming and GAs, we, we can't guarantee that we've reached the absolute maximum maximorum, and we have to stop at some point, typically. Sometimes we can, but typically we start. So these are concrete steps. The target, the rule constituents, the permissible concatenations, some fitness measure, what algorithm and what stopping rule, right? So from this, uh, from this uh, forthcoming collection, here are some examples. Uh, Grieger, Ants, and Major, uh, it's a flocking pattern is the target. There's a reference behavior that was actually taken from the famous Boyd's model. And starting completely from scratch and random positions, they're able to evolve flocking behavior that looks stunningly like the target. Another one, uh, the Chataka Gunaratne and Erez and I and Ivan uh, decided to extend the shelling segregation model to grow mixed segregation patterns. And here the repertoire of primitives is larger than shellings. Shellings, of course, was only preference on race, but you know, we have a larger repertoire of primitives, including your preference to just be an ice. Some people just want to be alone, isolation. Another, some people. There's a, there's a cost to moving, and that might enter into the deliberations. And again, all of these things, I refer you to the papers for, for the details. Uh, another work that, uh, that uh, Tuang Vu and uh, several of us have been involved in, also forthcoming, is to try to generate simultaneously, as a kind of multi-objective problem, uh, the male and female time series of alcohol use in New York State over several decades. Other targets include polarized opinion dynamics uh, and experimental results, results in a common pool resources irrigation game that Lux Miranda and uh, Aslam Garibay uh, will be publishing it's also in this issue. All right, so next issue is the rule constituents. Here were some targets. What are the ingredients? What's in the primordial soup from which we're going to involve these things? So in the work uh, with, with Chataka, mixed segregation was the goal. Now, Schelling, of course, was only interested in racial preference and showed famously that very low levels of it generate segregation. We want to break that and get mixed patterns, and we need to add other considerations. So we are interested not just in Schelling's race ingredient, but in isolation, distance, the age of the, the uh, neighborhood you're considering and so forth. And they're combined in the fittest case in complicated nonlinear ways. Uh, Nonlinearity is an important feature in, in most of this. If you restrict combinations only to linear ones, it constrains evolution very, very uh, seriously. And of course, there might be other operators, you know, besides mathematical ones, there could be logical ones like if, then, and even deontic uh, ones, normative ones, like obligation and permissibility, right? I mean, in deontic logic, you could say it's obligatory to do X and permissible to do X. And other constituents are these from the uh, Lux Miranda and Aslam Garibay. They're interested in how students performed in an upstream downstream irrigation experiment. And whether you have homophily with people upstream and homophily with people downstream matters uh, and so forth. And they had a nonlinear concatenation of inputs and fitness here was defined as one minus the distance between the uh, posited agent and the observed dynamics, the agent output and the observed output. It's kind of a mean squared difference idea. But there are other fitness metrics in uh, the Gunaratne et al. paper, uh, we used Erez Hatna's C index to measure the degree of segregation or non-segregation. In uh, the Vu et al. paper, 
we use an implausibility metric from approximate Bayesian computation, as in the paper by Adrianakis in 2015. Uh, Rory Grieg and uh, his colleagues used mean square error on the flocking patterns and the uh, opinion dynamics. And as you just saw in the Miranda and Garabay paper, the normalized square difference between target output and model output. All right, different combinators. So we've talked about targets and constituents, different combinators and stopping rules. Mathematical ones include the obvious plus minus divide, multiply, exponentiate, square root, log, absolute value, and so on. There could be logical ones like not and and, evolutionary ones, mutation and crossover. These are typical and recursive ones you can you can nest like log of log of x but you can also constrain that for reasons of interpretability or computation time or other things okay here's the table from the forthcoming section of all of these components for every one of the uh models every one of the targets so the segregation model has this target and you can see the primitives the combinators the fitness metric the program that was used and so forth. Flocking, same thing. Opinion dynamics, same thing. You can see that they have different combinators uh, from very simple ones to very complicated ones. And, uh, and, and so it goes for the program used, for the stopping rule and so on. So again, as in all modeling, it's important that we be able to replicate these results. And in this table, you see what was done. And again, I refer you to the specific papers for more detail. Okay? All right. Uh, I think what the table says to me, and what this whole talk says to me, is that inverse generative social science is not the end of theory, but it changes the locus of theory from the completed agent to agent constituents, rules, modules, building blocks, and so on. These building blocks still have to be germane to the problem at hand. You can't have a rule that says, pick a preferable shelling site and also eat a cookie. That'll generate the same segregation pattern. But you know, you, we need to prune out these our algorithmic Darwinian tubercles, superfluous elements of the rule for parsimony, if nothing else. And we have to meet defensible notions of cognitive plausibility. And all of this will still require human judgment, but at a different level agent primitives, concatenations, modules, and the work can depart from some human's model, as in the shelling case, or agent zero, or all sorts of other intelligently or hopefully intelligently designed, uh, you know, base models, all right? All of it raises several challenges that I think are worth addressing, both challenges to agent-based modeling and challenges for agent-based modeling. One challenge to agent-based modeling, is this, agent models are not robust. Given a successful rule, I often get the question, okay, great, but what if you change the rule a little? Do you get the same output? Is the output robust to a small change in the agent rules? So a coherent answer obviously requires us to agree on what we mean by a small change in a rule. And of course, as we discussed, we have lots of ways to define a metric between the model generated pattern, the macro pattern or meso pattern or what have you, and the real world target pattern. And we also know what we mean by a small change in a numerical parameter. But what do we mean by a small change in rules? A tempting and bad answer is that the distance between two rules is small if and only if the distance between their generated outputs is small. That's fatal because it's impossible to even assert that a small change in rules produced a large change in output or that output was invariant under a huge change in rules. Both of those statements are precluded by the definition itself, but are obviously things we care about. So we need independent, not interdefined metrics for the domain space of rules and the image space of model outputs. We have options for metrizing the latter, which we've seen, but do we have useful options for metrizing, putting a formal distance metric on the space of rules itself? Yes, uh, we do. I mean, I guess what I'm just to be, could, you, could it be sensible, in other words, to say that the rule call home 
is closer to the rule, eat a pie, than it is to the rule, vote for Jones. It seems nonsensical, right? But in fact, you sure we can do that. We can do that in several ways. None accord with any intuition of rule proximity, but we can put a metric on rules, no problem, agent rules, by encoding them as strings of zeros and ones and computing the Hamming distance between them. Okay, sure. Can you, can you metrize it? Yep. But the problem is if I encode the rule, uh, let's start with the rule zero, 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 zero. Then there are five rearrangements, rearrangements of the same rule that are one Hamming unit away from that. All right, they're 01000, 00100, and so forth, right? So some of these encode complete gibberish, and many of the grammatical strings so constructed would not be rules at all, much less synonymous ones. So, you know, Hamming distance is possible, but all sorts of things are the same Hamming distance away and rearrangement conserves Hamming distance, but it doesn't conserve meaning. And if I may be permitted a bit of an aside on Moby Dick and Mozart, uh, this business about rearrangement and what, what actually preserves. So, you know, we, we learn that word and note frequencies are power law distributed. And I think it's fair to say we are invited to marvel that this is capturing or unifying something about great literature and music. Why otherwise, why would why would use Moby Dick and not the phone book, right? But you know, every rearrangement of the 200,000 words of Moby Dick will have the same frequency distribution, and many will be gibberish. Only one in the 200,000 factorial rearrangements is Melville's novel. The one over F noise distribution of notes in a Mozart sonata is the same if you play the sonata backwards or upside down or both or with random notes where the notes randomize. So these rearrangements have the same frequency distribution, but they're not works of Western tonal music. So I think there's a certain amount of self mystification going on in this, uh, in this particular literature. But back to, back to metrizing rule space, hamming distance is bad. You could also do it in another way. You could take all the symbols and spaces in the alphabet and construct a girdle number for every concatenation that is an agent rule. And if PI is the ith prime number, there's a unique girdle number for any rule. And in turn, there's a distance between two rules, which is the absolute difference between their girdle numbers. But is it actually useful to do that? Logicians just don't care about the distance between P implies Q and Q implies P. Computer scientists don't care about the distance between programs or partial recursive functions. And more important for us, we're challenged. Has it robust to a, a small change in rules? Neither do our critics care much about this actually. So economists don't care about the distance between utility functions. Here's a bunch of utility functions. The economic agent's rule is maximize use subject to a budget constraint. The budget constrained optimal will obviously depend on numerical parameters like the total budget, factor prices, but a small change in rule could only mean a change in the algebraic form of the utility function. So, okay, it's a fair question, but it's also a fair question for us to ask them, what if you change the rule, the algebraic form of the utility function a little, is the optimum robust? So would the substitution of Leontief's utility function for the Cobb-Douglas utility function constitute a small or large change in the rule? Are quasi-linear utilities closer to perfect substitutes than to CES utility functions? You know, for the space of mathematical functions, we, can, we have metrics, but I've never seen any economics article or textbook that even cares about this. So detractors seem troubled that the agent-based model, agent-based modeling can't define robustness to a small change in rules, but they're you know, blithely unaware that they can't either. And more important that it doesn't hamper them in the least. So I don't think this is actually such a serious problem for us. Uh, the real gripe, you know, is that agent modeling is an elegant, unified, and general like utility maximization. But, you know, utility maximization is hardly unified if you can choose from a huge menagerie of utility functions. 
including the ones I listed, but also random utilities, prospect theoretical utilities. With uncertainty, you have the risk averse uh, family, constant relative risk aversion, all discounted exponentially and hyperbolically in every other way. Uh, so, you know, if utility maximization just means that for any observed behavior, there's some proper utility function maximized by that behavior, then the theory of utility maximization isn't falsifiable, as argued by Sid Winter, Akerlof and Schiller, and several others in Hodgson's uh, 19, 2013 book. So if that's all it means, it's not falsifiable. On the other hand, the proposition that agents are maximizing at all has been challenged by a host of psychologists and cognitive scientists that I mentioned before, but from Simon to Kahneman to the behavioral economists. I think it's too strong to say that rational choice theory is unfalsifiable or already falsified. But it is fair to say that the settings to which it applies are less than universal and that the theory is less unified than widely presumed. So again, we need formal alternatives to the rational actor. I think that's really a central goal. One of those is a very crude and provisional one of those is agent zero, but we need to evolve from there as well. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The evolved agents, this is a second issue, may be fitter than the base agent, but more complex. And this raises an important trade-off for inverse generative social science. In earlier work uh, with Tuang Vu and uh, Robin Pursehaus and others, uh, we were also modeling alcohol consumption. Uh, and this model had four primitives, payoff, autonomy, the injunctive norm, which is what you consider to be the, uh, the, 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 the norm of the community. What, what's the level of social equilibrium associated with drinking? And the descriptive uh, statistics of it, what's the actual prevalence? And five permissible concatenations, plus minus, times square root and nesting. And you can see that the GPs, these are genetic programs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they have model size big for the, you know, model size was, uh, was the, uh, you know, the number of turns. Um, and fitness and model size are inversely ordered, right? The simplest one just has payoff as the utility function. And the most complicated one, has this complicated combination of the factors, all the factors, and it has a high fitness and the easy one has a low fitness, okay? And there's a clear trade-off in that case, in that work between comprehensibility and the accuracy of the model, right? The model size is high, it's hard to, hard to understand, but it's highly fit. And the model is very simple, uh, but it's very, has a large error, all right? So complexity and uh, fitness might trade off. And I think that's something we certainly will have to consider in this area. Uh, one way to do this is to penalize fitness for rule complexity. And in the VU et al. paper forthcoming in JASP, we do penalize fitness for rule complexity, which we define simply as the number of nodes in the grammar-based tree representation of the agent. And this biases selection toward more human interpretable rules. Again, if we're just about black box prediction, we don't care if the rules are predictable. If we care about generative explanation and cognitive plausibility, then we do. Now, in that case, you can see learning was stepwise. And another feature that we observe in this line of work, not, not unique to us and not, not entirely unheard of before, uh, is punctuated equilibrium. It illustrates that evolutionary learning is not smooth, but occurs in jumps as new rule constituents are added. And again, from the flocking model, there are a variety of things it learns as it increases its fitness. The loss is the uh, y-axis, so the lower, uh, the better the fit. And it starts pretty much at random and then learns how to normalize and then learns about separation distance and alignment and learns cohesion. And in the end, you get this very, very nice replication of the observed flocking pattern. Again, to uh, leave you to this, and again, that's many people in genetic program would, would, would expect this, but it's still a characteristic of evolution that's interestingly preserved in this, uh, in this line of work. 
all right? And it also exhibits conserved elements. So, you know, in the shelling rule, shelling's initial thing that got, shelling's rule is just preference of, for neighborhood on race. But you can see that that's conserved in this highly fit evolved rule. And similarly, in the case of drinking behavior, autonomy is conserved. It appears, I mean, payoff only is conserved in all of these rules. So we see conserved elements. So we can't metrize rule space, can't put a proper neighborhood on the set of rules. That is to say, all rules within the Euclidean distance D of one another. That's just not sensible. But we can evolve phyla of rules beginning completely from scratch or with a parent model like Schelling's. And we disassemble it, put the constituents in a larger primal soup and evolve new fit rules for an existing problem or for a new problem. Chattaka Gunaratne and Ivan Garabe evolved new rules for the ancient Anasazi that do better than ours, that Rob and I and others published in PNAS. They're a little bit more complex, but they're certainly plausible. That's great, that's, that's progress. We're not wedded to any model. We're only wedded to the method that Popper called conjectures and refutations, all right? So I think it's great if we do better than the models we've designed. Uh, you can begin with random agents, or you can begin with a Garden of Eden intelligently designed agent. Here, this is from Miranda and, and Garibay, where, you know, here is the homophily upstream, here's the homophily downstream. There's all sorts of combinations of these. Uh, and you can start by at, from scratch as the, as the flocking modelers did, or you can design with an original rule, start with an original rule like, like we did for the Schelling mixed segregation model. Uh, you know, I think of agent zero as one promising, possibly promising candidate for disassembly and evolution. Uh, we will be doing that. I'm, we're doing that, Erez, Hatna, and I, and others. And of course, we welcome others to collaborate in that. Uh, with Erez and uh, Jiwan Shin, we've been extending Agent Zero into several spheres, conserving some constituents and displacing others. Just to mention that one line of work is Agent Zero cognitive epidemiology, which is a double entendre in that, you know, we care about the role of cognition and the behavior driven by cognition in the progress of infectious diseases. How does behavior affect epidemiology? And what are the cognitive drivers of behavior? But the double entendre is that the cognitive drivers can also be contagious in their own right. And we've done quite a lot of work on coupled contagion of fear and disease. And I know others here have, are also working in that area, Paul Smaldino, others. So I think this is a very fertile area. Another one is addict zero. Now, Asian models are all, always accused of being ad hoc, but of course, Becker and Murphy's model is incredibly ad hoc. They don't even include any neurobiology of addiction at all. It's just rational actor. Uh, so, you know, in this work on addict zero, we've morphed agent zero. We took the affective fear module and replaced it with a simple model uh, of the neurobio neurobiology of dependence or addiction. So I think this is all a fruitful line of work. I'm not saying we have to scrap intelligent design. We can start with intelligent design, but we can also start with, uh, with, with random components. So there's lots of ways to go about this, but I don't think uh, it's the end of theory. I think it might be, uh, you know, the, the dawn of another way of doing business. All right, now in agent zero, and I think again, in agent zero, what I said is the goal is not to get the components finished, but to get the synthesis started. So again, whether this particular agent or some distant progeny yet to emerge, I believe this broad family tree of individuals each capable of emotional learning, or biological addiction, bounded rationality and social connection is well worth developing. And today here, I would say, well worth evolving within this larger enterprise of inverse generative social science. So to wrap up, we're interested, we start with forward generative social science. And there we're interested in distinguishing between explaining and predicting we're interested in a species of explanation that I've been calling generative, uh, that is not in the same tradition as Nash equilibrium or 
the Gary Becker, Richard Bellman, optimal control, Pontryagin, maximum principle pedigree. We're not necessarily interested in equilibrium or in aggregate macro to macro modeling, even though it might be predictive or physics. Uh, growing macroscopic or mesoscopic or other target phenomena is necessary. It's not sufficient. The generators are candidates. Uh, we want formal alternatives to the rational actor. And these might not be unique. There might be many ways to grow it. Now here, you know, okay, so right, of course, no problem. In many sciences, there's competing hypotheses. So if we have many agent models that grow the phenomena, well, we have to sort those out by collecting new data uh, or devising new experiments or doing the usual things any science does in adjudicating between competing hypotheses. So that's fine. Uh, Backward IGSS, this is, can we deepen the search for these multiple generative candidates? And I think that using AI, I think it's been demonstrated that yes, uh, these can be used to develop or construct or discover families of generators. And although they can't be proper mathematical neighborhoods, they can be phyla. And that can be very interesting in its own right. And the phyla can all satisfy a generative explanatory standard or the fittest elements of the phyla can. I think the unified enterprise of generative social science and inverse generative social science, it retains the generative explanatory epistemology, but revolutionizes the theory construction kit. So in my view, this is not the end of theory. It might even be its rejuvenation. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, a million things to discuss. I'm desperately sorry I can't be there to bomb around and talk about all of this with you. Uh, I will co-chair also virtually the uh, session on inverse generative science that Gary mentioned. I believe that's on Thursday. My co-chair will be Tuong Vu. I'm happy to discuss anything you like and please follow up. Here's my email, consider us colleagues, shoot me an email. If there's something you wanna talk about or if there's something you wanna collaborate on, just let me know, okay? So with that, I thank you and I'm happy to entertain any questions, criticisms, what have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great talk, uh, Joshua. Now, uh, we've overrun a little, but I'm hoping uh, that you will not mind if we stay on a little bit longer. To Absolutely have a not. Discussion. Delighted. Um, Delighted. Uh, so uh, I thought it would be a nice thing if we let some of the people attending remotely uh, ask a question first. Please, please. So do we have any questions from online? No. Then, we, have, uh, we have some uh, chat. No, I don't have any chat questions yet. No. Uh, Not okay, that I see. Well, I would ask the people online to be thinking of questions if you want to. Otherwise, I'll open up. To I have a question. Oh, there's someone with a question online. Sure. Go for it. Ask your question. Yeah. Hi, Josh. This is uh, Norman Johnson. Hey, how are you? <clears throat> We're good. Um, so a lot of, I, I totally agree with what you say and uh, strongly agree. It reminds me, though, of what the artificial life community attempted for almost a decade from the mid 90s to 2000 something. And it was largely a failure because uh, they could not show a computational method that it was actually, in your words, maybe generative, but uh, in their words, innovative. For example, they could not show how an eye might uh, evolve. And <clears throat> uh, largely that was due to the use of genetic algorithms optimizing parameters in the model. Uh, so one, one just question of, you know, maybe the real crux here is, you know, how do we come up with a true algorithm that is innovative? And to use complexity parlance, uh, you know, has emergent properties. Uh, one of the experiences I had, which, uh, I haven't published was about 10 years ago, working on a project where we uh, used genetic algorithms on decision trees. So not 
not in rules as you're suggesting, but actually totally modifying the decision tree. And of course, many of them were failures, but it produced uh, results that were amazingly innovative. Uh, you know, uh, unassociated agents started developing differentiation and the different types and stuff. So response, I'd be real curious what you think. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for your for your for your question. Uh, I, I actually whether a life was able to replicate, you know, uh, animal visual systems and the like, I, I, I really don't feel qualified. to. That's so not really what I've been up to for social systems. I mean, we have already examples of evolutionary replication of actual data. I mean, for example, this paper by Gunaratna and uh, Garibay, we start with an actual target, the, the history and demography and settlement patterns of this ancient civilization, the uh, Anasazi, and they evolve rules that actually generate that. And they do a better job than our original Santa Fe Institute group did in generating those. And I think in many cases we have, you know, we can, sh you know, we say you got a better mouse trap, you got to show me some mice. There are quite a few mice where, you know, we use the general approach and get results that are empirically credible, that match experiments, that match data, that match time series, that match spatial geographic patterns and so on. So I think the kind of proof is in the empirical pudding. And I think we have some good examples. I mean, I think, you know, undoubtedly there are failures uh, and hopefully we can learn from them. That's, you know, uh, I hope that's a reasonable answer. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, so let's have a question from the room now. Is uh, anyone got a question? Yeah, we have one, uh, this gentleman here. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, so when you contrast the sort of the agent zero research and the uh, effective stuff that you included in the agent decision making architecture, I found that really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to reconciling that with sort of evolving primitives, what is obviously if you try to evolve the primitives to maybe evolve like an effective architecture, a result, you know, um, an agent architecture that generates uh, target social phenomena, the parameter space is become going to become bigger and bigger. So say in Schelling's model, some of the primitives might be, you know, behave, you know, um, uh, the threshold you have to be comfortable with, uh, you know, how many in-group members you need to be comfortable. But if we take that to the language of affect, then you have, you know, in-group salience and uh, other sort of uh, things which will result in like a much uh, um, larger space of parameters. So how would you address that? Because that would require massive computational power. Well, I went by kind of fast. I mean, one, one idea is to penalize fitness for complexity. You can sort of enforce parsimony by making parsimony part of fitness. And we've done that in some of this alcohol modeling. Uh, I agree that if you're, you know, if you're not careful and disciplined, you can proliferate rules uh, and primitives uh, like crazy. I would just clarify one thing. We're not evolving primitives, we're positing them. Those are like the chemical elements uh, and the way they can be combined is constrained by the laws of physics. And for us, the laws of physics are this small range of combinators. And again, I think, you know, you raise a good point. If we're undisciplined, it can get completely unwieldy and impenetrable. But, you know, okay, so we need to be disciplined and limit the number of primitives or prune them. Humans can help prune them. Uh, and we can force the GA to pick uh, minimal, more comprehensive solutions. Again, if we're interested only in predicting, we don't care. I can have some complicated black box that I'm never going to understand, but if it tells me tomorrow's stock price, I don't care. That's all I care about. But if we care about explaining, I agree with you entirely. It needs to be comprehensible. And for that reason, it needs to be relatively comprehensive, relatively simple and parsimonious and transparent. So all I can say is, it's obviously a problem. We need to keep our eye on it. And we can build in a requirement that things be simple by putting a complexity penalty on the fitness function itself. 
if that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think uh, we'll take one more question and then close the session. Uh, there's one right at the back there, just to let you run. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yes, I, I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you so much for it. Um, no, no. My question is in relation to how we can capture heterogeneity. Um, so forgive me if this is a, a rudimental question or if um, this, or it's just my lack of understanding of ev evolutionary algorithms. But um, I think the, the thing about completed agents is that at the initial stage of the model, you're able to somehow capture the individual differences and attributes in which you're interested in and i just i just wondered to myself how how can we i guess in in this process how and where will we be able to um ensure that the agent heterogeneity in which we really need to capture and which we believe is is fundamental actually to the outcome of our model um and and we believe or we perceive to be in the real world system um how can we make that um Apparent or how, how and where do we, do we generate that, I guess, is, is, is my question. I think that's a fabulous question and a very central and deep question. And again, I think the, 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 we need to initialize these models with enough heterogeneity in the primitives that they do generate different kinds of agents. I mean, I, I think, you know, a while ago, Rob Axtell and I did a paper on uh, the timing of retirement that everyone had predicted would conform to the Bellman equation, would totally Gary Becker Bellman equations, at the optimal control, here's when you should retire. And of course, nobody retired then. And there was some much more complicated dynamics. So Rob and I thought, okay, let's build a model where there's three kinds of agents. One agent tosses a fair coin when he's eligible to retire and retires if it's heads. Another one does the complete Bellman Gary Becker calculation, the hyper rational agent. So there's a random, rational and other agents do what the majority in their network uh, does. And we found that the best fit to the data was if 85% of them are imitators, 10% uh, are rationals and 5% are randoms. So again, I think we need to evolve on the mix of heterogeneous agent types. And part of fitness will be what is the mix of agents the level of heterogeneity, the type of heterogeneity that is actually required to explain the phenomena. In the collection, I don't think we really do that. And I think that's a very, very important question for the entire enterprise. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot to a lot of work to be done there, and it's a very deep penetrating issue. So thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, again, I'm sorry we started a little bit late. And, uh, in a way, not sorry at all that we overran. It was really interesting and, and, and great to hear the, uh, and great to hear some lovely discussion. But nice to see you, even if virtually. And my thanks Likewise. also to the other virtual participants and to everybody here. Thanks again. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Gary, can you, can you, thank you. Thank you all, very good. Gary, could you stay on for a couple seconds? Yeah, I'll stay on a bit if you would like. Okay, that'd be great. All right, well, thank you all and talk again and email me. <laughs>